pleasure for me to extend my warmest, uh, our warmest welcome to all of you to, to attend this uh, annual BCI conference, Bristol Commerce Institute conference, 2021. So on behalf of, uh, of Stephen Hallett, my co-director colleague, myself and, and all the team, uh, we hope you will enjoy this, this, uh, this today's event, this conference. Uh, a practical piece of information, just, uh, just uh, if you have any questions to the presentations, uh, please uh, post them in, in the chat and not in the Q&A. We'll pick them up as, as best we can during the day, but the chat, please use the chat. So uh, with no further ado, let me just get started here, see if I can get this to work. So I don't think I need to, to, to say a lot about the University of Bristol to you. Most of you will be well aware of, of our presence at the University and City, but just a few words. So you will know that Bristol is a, is a vibrant city with a, with a very rich history. Uh, it was once the gateway to America, Americas, uh, then it's the center of, uh, of fine uh, Victorian engineering, and it's the center for technology today. The university dates back to, uh, it started as a college in, in 1876 and received its royal charter in 1909. Uh, it's a full, uh, uh, say, uh, a university in the sense that it covers uh, all, all, all the faculties, you could say, so with six faculties, engineering, science, uh, uh, health sciences, social sciences, law, biomedical science, and so on. It's a medium-sized university, I guess we could say about 30,000 students, uh, uh, slightly short of 22,000 undergraduates and about 8,000 postgraduates. Engineering at, at Bristol, of course, is where, sorry about that, Engineering at the University of Bristol, of course, is where uh, Bristol Commerce Institute is, is, uh, is, is seated. And uh, it's one of the six faculties, and, and you can see the numbers here. Uh, in an overall sense, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the Faculty of Engineering addresses basically the overall challenges. So it's challenge driven and, and aligning uh, science topics to, uh, to address these, these challenges. You can see listed here. Bristol Composites Institute was established in 2007 as the Advanced Composites Center for Innovation and Science, AXIS. It was founded by Professor Michael Wisnum, uh, and, and uh, it, it was granted status as a, as a specialized research institute in 2017. It brings together composites research across the university. We are uh, uh, 31 academic staff as of today but we have 30 further affiliated academics in engineering, science, and, and medicine. Uh, the focus uh, is the focus for collaboration between academia and industry. And currently we have uh, well above 25 million pounds in current research grants. Overall, we are we're more than 230 people, including staff, uh, support staff, uh, uh, graduate students, and researchers. So Stephen Hall and myself uh, were appointed as, as co-directors uh, by 1st October this year. So this is our first annual conference uh, as, 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 as co-directors. Uh, we took over from Michael Wisdom, as already said. And uh, if you look at the overall, uh, say, theme for what BCI is, so we strive to be a, a world-leading institute for composites, education, and research. And we combine cutting-edge fundamental sciences with strong industrial links for exploitation and technology transfer. Uh, we are structured with three research themes, uh, manufacturing and design, uh, led by Dimitri Ivanov, materials led by Fabrizio Scarpa, and structures led by Giuliano Alecchi. And you'll hear more from, from the theme leads a little bit later this morning. And we have extensive lab facilities as well as, as facilities for modeling. I also want to extend a warm welcome to, to new uh, 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 colleagues and new academic staff that we appointed this year. So first, uh, Marco Longano, who's our new lecturer in Composites Manufacturing. Jonathan Bellnew is our NCC lecturer in Composites Process Simulation. So he's one of a, a, a hopefully number of, of, uh, of new colleagues that will be jointly appointed between the National Composite Center and the, and the uh, and Bristol Composite Institute. And you'll hear me about, about the status at the NCC a little bit later in a talk from, uh, from Enrique Garcia. Also, we have appointed Werner Groh as our new lecturer in Digital Engineering of, of Structures. 
And then Neha Chandarana is our new lecturer in bio-based and sustainable composites. We have we are we are hosting a, a, a two two uh, a doctoral centers, and the first I want to mention today is the Industrial Doctoral Center at the IDC for for, for composite manufacturing. And just very briefly about that, we we just we recently in October uh, ran an event, a showcase event at Engineers House, so the first physical event, really where we could bring all the researchers together, showcasing the research. We were more than sixty people attending, including alumni, academics, and industrial supervisors. So we think it was a really good success. Along, along with that, we launched the IDC brochure uh, to mark the achievements of the, of the IDC. And for those of you who have not got it or would want to have it, uh, please uh, let us know and we can provide you with a link or we can send it to you. And this included uh, posters and presentations from all current research engineers. We also are hosting the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the CDT COSIM, so it's a composite science and, 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 and engineering and, and manufacturing. The Center for Doctoral Training. And uh, also a, a very significant activity with us, of course, we had the Welcome Week. Uh, this also was a very big success and we ran a, a hackathon in, in November. And I should also mention uh, mm -hmm. that Chantal from CDT19 was nominated uh, by a fellow student as Woman in Engineering, Hero for Women in, in Engineering Day this, this year. And Tom Pratt from, from the, the CDT20 participated in I am an engineer get me out of here in March 2021 so this year we are as, as already mentioned very closely related to and, and, and uh, affiliated with the National Composite mm -hmm. Center and Enrique Garcia will give you an, an overview of that as well as an update on activity there today so the NCC is a University of Bristol owned facility it's operated independently on behalf of the industrial members. So, so BCR and NCC are increasingly integrated together, uh, working very closely together to provide a world leading capability from fundamental research to, to industrial exploitation. So it's very much about transitional research, bringing fundamental research uh, up to higher technology readiness levels, uh, for instance, to our so-called technology poultry programs uh, together with the NCC. And our, our, our uh, industrial doctoral center research engineers uh, that are based at NCC provide one of those very strong links between us. We also have extensive joint training activities and access to the lab facilities at NCC. So I, I will now hand over to, to Stephen Held by my fellow co-director. Stephen. Okay, thank you, Ole. So there are many different parts to, to the Bristol Composites Institute. And I, one couldn't say that any one um, one part of the, the BCI um, defines it more than, than any other. Um, so we've already heard about the, the links to the, the National Composite Center from Ole, uh, and also the, the CDTs and the, the IDC, which is also linked to the uh, SEMCOM Future Composites Manufacturing Research Hub. I'd like to now just elaborate on some of the other parts as well, particularly our uh, strong industry and academic partnerships. So at the sort of major level, we have long running and well-established industry partnerships. For example, the, the Rolls-Royce uh, supported UTC, University Technology Center, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult Wind Blade Research Hub, and, and a, a partnership with Vestas. And together we, we work closely uh, to deliver both innovation and technology transfer for real world industry challenges. We also have several major academic partnerships for example, we are joint leads on the Simcomp Manufacturing Hub together with Nottingham, and this gives us uh, significant links into a broad base of uh, academic partners right across the UK. We have programme grants, both with Imperial College and also one with Bath, Exeter and Southampton. And we have recently set up a dual degree with TU Dresden and the first um, PhD student Mario Valverde had his viva just just a, a week just over a week ago, and we also have co tutel agreements with RMIT in Australia and TU Delft in the Netherlands. But these are not just um, the, the limit of what we have; these are just the the, the, the most the, the largest and uh, most significant. But we have many many other relationships with with both companies, um, small and medium enterprises, and of course other universities. 
in terms of companies, it's probably about uh, 40 different companies that engage with us across um, BCI. So it's, it's very, can be very difficult to quantitatively measure um, the, the benefit of our research for um, industry and outside of academia. But the Research England does uh, try to do that through the, the Research Excellence Framework that runs across all UK universities. Um, and this was recently completed um, late, 20, late in 2020 or early 2021 and is now in the evaluation phase. And this, for this, we write up uh, impact case studies which show the value of our research outside of academia. And across most of engineering, where we were required to submit nine case studies for REF 2021, BCI contributed two of these. So it's over 20% of, of the, um, the output. And these were one on, uh, together with Rolls-Royce, on BCI technology that has been adopted for design and manufacture of composite fan blades, uh, giving cost and weight saving. And another one with um, a comp small company, uh, LMAP, that was founded by one of our past PhD students who has embedded numerical techniques from BCI uh, into uh, software. And this capability has been deployed in manufacturing across major wind energy, airframe, and engine, aero engine um, um, OEMs. We not only work with companies, we also create them. We have uh, some, some innovative spin-outs that are arisen from our lower TRL EPSRC projects. There's ICOMAT, which um, is exploiting novel tow shearing technology that allows rapid defect-free fiber steering. And this was one of the finalists in the 2021 Jet Group Awards. And I've given the, the website there for, for if you want to look up more information about them. And then more recently, uh, we formed uh, Linear Composites, which is exploiting our hyperdiff technology for aligned short fiber composites, which gives higher um, than the usual uh, mechanical performance and great formability. And most significantly, this allows the use of reclaimed chop fibers, which supports our sustainability goals. And again, there's a website there if you wish to follow up. So if we look to the future, we, you can see that we have a strong commitment to working with our industry, academic and international partners, as well as the NCC. And together, we will address both the current and future scientific and engineering challenges, ranging right from the uh, basic fundamental research through to technology transfer. These can be grouped into broadly three areas of sustainability, net zero, and digital composites. And the first two you'll hear more about um, later today. And the sustainability, we're working on topics such as natural fibers, recycled materials, advanced resin systems, and of course, much more. As we push towards net zero carbon emissions, hydrogen storage, light weighting of structures, renewable energy, electro, location of transport and beyond are all important. And then there's the digital composites agenda where we were working on advanced numerical models, manufacturing and design simulation, uh, implementation of um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and again, much more besides. So th there are many ways of working with us. And if anything you see today uh, catches your interest, please do get in contact with us and we can talk about um, the opportunities for uh, collaboration and interaction. Next is Enrique Garcia from, from NCC. Hello, um, I'm Enrique Garcia. Um, I'm the Chief Technology Officer at the NCC, and uh, I will uh, cover a little bit of uh, what we are, uh, expand a little bit on uh, what uh, Oli and Steve uh, Steve and I have already mentioned around the, the, the really strong collaboration between BCI and Simcom and the NCC. And then also we'll talk about uh, uh, future applications of, of composites and how composites can actually contribute significantly to the net zero agenda, especially after the couple of weeks uh, uh, around COP26, I think is quite relevant. So for those of you who don't know, uh, we as the National Composite Center as, are, are part of the catapult network and specifically we are part of the high value manufacturing catapult. Um, it's seven centers, uh, each one with a, a different specialty. Uh, and you can see the network is uh, all across the, the UK. 
Uh, obviously, we are the, the experts in composites, but there is uh, composite. There are composite capabilities also in some of the other centers, and we're coordinating. Essentially, the high value manufacturing catapult, where again seven different centers, we cover a lot of ground, 27 different technologies, over a billion worth of assets uh, of equipment, and what we do essentially is uh, bridging the value of death. Uh, and you probably have seen this already, but. Uh, <coughs> We work really closely with with uh, with industry uh, and try to develop solutions that are industrial applications. Um, but we also work quite closely with uh, with uh, the academics. So we're covering this uh, TRL four to TRL six uh, area basically. And uh, uh, what we try to do is uh, bring uh, challenges from industry into academia to find uh, the right solutions basically, and also try to identify the, the, the technologies that are developed by the academics that are high potential and then bring those into an industrial application. And this is the technology pull through program. Uh, the NCC in very quick numbers, so over 200 uh, million worth of uh, equipment. Uh, I will show you a couple of pictures, but I will run quite quickly over those. Probably the most interesting bit is uh, to, well, to say that uh, we have around 400 composite engineers at the NCC plus the 230 uh, people that uh, Oli mentioned in his presentation, there's a there's a lot of composite knowledge uh, in the uh, and composite knowledge applied to technology development in in Bristol. Um, composites is not the only thing we do. Uh, so Stephen already mentioned sustainability, and and this is actually one of the critical pillars of of what we do. Sustainable composites is, is an absolute must, and we're collaborating really closely with uh, with PCI on this. So on, on sustainable composites, we're, we're working on two different aspects, let's say. So one is, uh, uh, well, what do you do with the current materials? Uh, and we have a couple of programs, uh, uh, Steve already mentioned Hyperdiff, but uh, we do have a couple of programs in terms of finding possible applications for the current materials, but also Again, working really closely with PCI and uh, Ian Humberton's team, we we are trying to develop the next generation of composite materials that are really sustainable, really recyclable. Another really critical aspect, uh, and again, very much in line with what Stephen was was showing in terms of the three major uh, areas, is digital engineering. And uh, we, as the NCC, we're taking the lead on, on digital engineering for, for the region. We have a, a couple of programs, the Digital Engineering Technology and Innovation uh, program, that is, again, uh, marrying, well, uh, using digital technologies to really accelerate product development. So what we're doing is trying to connect, to have a really effective connection between design and manufacturing and in-service. The idea behind that is, uh, again, to making uh, product development significantly uh, shorter and more efficient. The other one is 5G encode. And uh, with 5G encode, what we're doing there is basically benchmarking 5G against uh, some of the other technologies. 5G in an industrial environment. So what we're doing is uh, having the first uh, test bed for 5G in an industrial environment in the country. And we're, again, we're working on uh, on both on both areas, what we're doing is developing, uh, on the one hand, enabling capabilities and then proving those technologies with uh, specific industrial examples that are relevant. I mentioned that I was going to show some of the capabilities that we have. I'm not going to bore you with all of the equipment that we have, but basically we do have industrial scale equipment. We can manufacture anything from uh, well, a small piece of paper all the way up to a full scale wing, literally. And uh, I would say that the center is uh, probably top, well, certainly top three in the world in terms of uh, capability and understanding of what to do with that capability, especially in the position. Uh, the position and two things reinforcement, I would say. So what you see there is uh, what we call the pilot line. Again, um, very large scale deposition. Uh, you have a Coriolis, uh, through thickness reinforcement, uh, preforming. This is an electro impact that can do fiber placement on ATL. We have braiding, we have NDT, we have high volume, uh, uh, high volume capabilities or high volume equipment uh, like uh, press forming and uh, uh, injection over molding and a lot. If you have any questions about this, I'm, I'm more than happy to 
to just answer that in the question and answers uh, section. Or, I mean, I would definitely invite you to, to come to the NCC and, and see what we can do. And again, uh, I mean, one thing is having the, the equipment. Uh, something significantly more difficult is actually having all of the capability associated to it. And uh, what we're doing is when we develop capability, we develop capability on the design, on the simulation, or the performance, simulation of the manufacturing processes, and then, of course, the manufacturing. So in terms of um, what we have been doing in, in the last few, well, couple of years, I guess, because we, we didn't speak that often, uh, I think that what we have right now is a much better coordinated technology development uh, across the UK. So we have already talked uh, both, uh, Oli, well, actually, Oli, Stephen, and I have both have all talked about uh, the close relationship with PCI uh, and also with Simcom. Uh, we have three joint appointments with the PCI now. Uh, Oli briefly mentioned the technology pull through, and we're really proud of this, where uh, we have a really good framework to get the good ideas from the academics uh, and then working with the academics, developing those ideas into industrial solutions. Uh, we're also part of the Knowledge Exchange Committee with Simcom. And, and again, that is the connection between academics and the research centers. Um, and we, we have also developed technology roadmaps in combination with uh, BCI and Simcom. So what we are trying to do is develop technology roadmaps that go across all of the TRL levels. So from TRL 1 all the way up to TRL 7 and then within the street to TRL 9. As I mentioned before, we're part of the high value manufacturing catapult and what we're doing there is uh, leading or coordinating all of the composites activity and the composites uh, development uh, in the HVMC network. So uh, there's obviously really strong capabilities in AMRC, also in WMG, mostly associated with uh, the automotive industry. CPI is the National Formulation Center and MTC also has capabilities. And what we're doing is just making sure that everything is really well coordinated. Also, in terms of industrial engagement, uh, well, what we have seen in the last two, three years is a, a massive increase in the diversity of the members uh, because composites are entering into new sectors. And uh, this is actually being reflected in the membership at the NCC. So what you see there on the, on the uh, bottom right is the, the current uh, tier one members or the, the big members of the NCC. And you can see there that uh, it's not only aerospace, which is still is a, a very fundamental piece of what we do, but you can see people like Vestas or, or sub C7 and Network Rail. So again, the most relevant thing is that uh, we we keep a really strong relationship with aerospace, but uh, all the centers, all the sorry, all the sectors are actually becoming also really really relevant. And also, we have been doing quite a lot of work with the Composite Leadership Forum. And uh, actually, the rest of my presentation is going to be a, a quick review of, of some of the work that we have done with the CLF. Um, so, again, composites are, are really relevant, and we all know that. Uh, but what we have done with the CLF uh, is basically just try to make sure to identify what composites can do uh, with respect to net zero. Uh, so as you know, the, the UK government is actually one of the leading governments in terms of a, a compromise to actually just get to the net zero as soon as possible. And what we have done is out of the 10 points that uh, the government identified as, as key for net zero, we have tried to set up a, an environment that explains quite clearly where composites can play a role. So the composites opportunity is pretty big. Uh, we have reports that say that it will continue growing uh, at least 9% per annum, and that's probably quite conservative, if you ask me. There's new sectors, as I mentioned, and again, the contribution to net zero is quite clear. So wind is one of the key aspects in terms of energy generation uh, from a renewable uh, source. Um, the UK already has the, the largest fleet of offshore turbines, and there's a clear commitment to, to offshore wind. And the way we see it, this cannot happen without composites, and it's already happening. And there's a clear commitment from the OEMs uh, to the UK. So there's uh, both Siemens Gamesa and LM Blades have committed to well, essentially set up, either double up the factory or set up a new factory. Vestas probably will end up doing something similar, although they already have a presence here. And then 
what we as the BCI and the NCC are doing is uh, clearly trying to push the boundaries. So there's two fundamental things. One is uh, the blades keep growing and growing and growing. So th there's a need for new technologies to be developed there. But also there's uh, also a, a, a clear uh, commitment of the industry to well, find solutions for the, the blades that are going to be decommissioned. Uh, and this is where sustainability plays a fundamental role. And both the B BCI and, and the NCC are, again, collaborating quite closely in finding solutions for the current blades, but also finding solutions for the next generation of blades. Nuclear um, is also uh, quite an important uh, aspect of, of the net zero. And you might have read that uh, actually today the government announced that uh, there will be significant funding for the development of small nuclear reactors. Uh, we are in conversations with, uh, with Rolls-Royce and some of the other key players on this, and we strongly believe that there is a, a, a use of composites that can really unlock uh, SMRs, both on the, on the reactor side, probably not for the first generation, but maybe for the next one, in terms of high temperature composites. But more interestingly, uh, the SMRs are going to be manufactured meaning that, that they will be industrialized and, and composites can play a role in, in a lot of the other modules uh, around the modular vector. Also in fusion, if you think about the, the kind of temperatures that you see in, in the fusion reactors, what we are seeing and we are collaborating quite closely with UKAA, we are developing technologies that will allow composites to play a significant role at the, at the heart of the fusion reactor. Hydrogen is obviously quite important uh, in the net zero. Uh, and uh, what we're seeing is that, uh, especially in, in transport, hydrogen will play a significant role. Um, and there are composites, again, there's, I guess, two or three main applications for composites. Uh, composite pressure vessels, when we're talking about surface transport, cryogenic tanks, probably more applicable to, to aerospace, but there's also the pipes that allow the, the logistics of, of the tr transportation of, the, of that hydrogen, uh, where we are developing quite a lot of technology. Again, the future of mobility certainly is, uh, is, needs to be sustainable. So hydrogen will play a role probably in, in the large uh, volume in the buses, trains, trucks. Uh, electric vehicles are probably going to be the more fundamental one around automotive side. Uh, but even then, uh, and even there, uh, composites can play a significant role to lightweight those electric vehicles, and that would increase the range. Going back to, to hydrogen, what you see on the, on the right is the expectation uh, in terms of demand for pressure vessels. And as you can see, as things evolve, uh, the demand is absolutely, I mean, could become really massive if, if we can really crack and find solutions to cost-effective uh, composite storage for, for hydrogen, then the need for, for composite materials is going to essentially dwarf pretty much every other sector. And the UK is, is taking the right strides to actually capitalize on that, and we certainly are at, at, the, at the front of that. Uh, enabling uh, more sustainable aerospace, uh, is, is one of the other keys. And again, that goes into the, the lightweighting of, uh, of the, the aircraft uh, by using composites and the UK and the NCC are definitely a leader on, on that. But also uh, going back to the previous discussion, it, it's, uh, there's a lot that we can do in terms of uh, making aerospace more sustainable through the use of hydrogen and again, we're trying to contribute as much as possible on that. Defense is one of the other areas where composites already are playing a role, a very significant role, uh, both in uh, new programs like Tempest or, or the FCAS, but also uh, in, in possible applications in space. And more and more, what we're seeing is uh, different technologies, different materials, but uh, quite a lot of interest and quite a lot of uh, possible applications in surface, uh, ships, submarines, helicopters, UAVs, and definitely missiles and satellites. So again, this will not happen 
without composites. And uh, what we're trying to do is to make sure that we really understand what the challenges are today so that we can find solutions uh, in, in the short term at the NCC and probably in the long term at the BCI and Simco. Construction infrastructure is one of the other areas that uh, has massive potential uh, to reduce carbon emissions. And again, we think that composites and, and geopolymers can definitely play a, a significant role in this. Um, composites, or more traditional composites in the side of, of modular and factory production. So similar to what I was mentioning around the, the SMRs, the small modular reactors, there's quite a, a, a really evident uh, business proposition, let's say, for, for composites to become more relevant. And also trying to lower down the emissions of, of the carbon uh, emissions of, of concrete manufacturing, geopolymers can definitely play a role. And again, here we're contributing or we're collaborating quite closely with, uh, with the BCI in the development of the next generation of concrete. And finally, sustainability. It, it's something that I have already mentioned and uh, as, as Stephen already mentioned too, it is one of the three pillars, uh, both for BCI and the NCC. Uh, composite materials are great for durability, and uh, that is most definitely playing a role in, in, again, places like construction infrastructure or offshore applications. And that, that in itself, it's, uh, it's more sustainable than less durable uh, materials, but actually uh, that's not enough. We definitely need to rethink uh, the recycling of, of composites if we really want for composites to play the role that I've been mentioning in all of the different aspects of the net zero agenda. We definitely need to find ways of making composites truly circular. And this is one of the aspects where, uh, again, we're collaborating more, more closely with, uh, with BCI. So just a quick uh, summary, uh, again, uh, a lot of the products that we currently use need to be reimagined if we want to get to net zero and, and composites can, can play a very significant role in all of them. Uh, in certain aspects like uh, aerospace, defense, it, it's, a, it's a major role. In other aspects, it's a, more of a secondary role or very primary role in very specific parts of the solution, let's say like hydrogen, for example, for the tanks. But what is quite clear is that, uh, again, nothing of this works if we cannot find ways of making composites more sustainable. So uh, a lot of the work that, uh, that we're certainly doing and that uh, what we're find, trying to find the right collaborators is, is around sustainability. So that was it from my side. Uh, like a whistle stop of, uh, of what we do and uh, what our focus, our current focus is. But uh, well, thank you very much and uh, I will welcome the questions. I will stop sharing. I hope it was clear. Um, oh, there's a question from Mustafa. Can you please explain the available ultrasonic facilities in BSI? Uh, well, I mean, I, I can definitely talk about the, the, the capabilities that we have at the NCC. So, um, as I said, we covered the full view of engineering and certainly we are doing quite a lot in both metrology and, and NDT. So in terms of NDT, we do have uh, capabilities that range from the materials lab. So probably not at the nanoscale, although we do have uh, X-ray uh, capabilities that are actually shared with BCI. But we can go all the way to the, the ultrasonic uh, inspection of a full scale wing and everything in between. So what we do is in terms of NDT, we have uh, ultras ultrasonic uh, solutions, but we also have sherography and uh, thermography that we're developing mainly for the wind. I don't know if I answer your question or not. I hope I do, but uh, we, can, we can talk about it later if you want. Um, question from Firas. Uh, do you also look at the biomedical applications of biocomposites? Uh, yes, yeah. Actually, we do, uh, although I have to say, we have been struggling to find demand for that, strangely enough. So we think that there's a, a lot of uh, applications in that area, but uh, to be honest, we are not necessarily finding the right people to talk to, if that makes sense. So if, if you do have uh, the right contacts, I, I would be really, really interested in, in doing more, because uh, we, we think that this 
very interesting applications, but we haven't been able to actually launch that in, in, in Anchor, if that makes sense. Question from Nore. Uh, are you planning to set up a recycling facility? Uh, not really. What we're doing is just trying to make sure that uh, we do have a clear understanding of what the different uh, recycling options are. Uh, so we're working with uh, BCI, certainly, and also working with CPI, which is one of our sister centers in the, in the Newcastle area, about the, the, well, the development of uh, solutions for uh, the current, I mean, to get back to raw materials, uh, some of the resins that we have right now, but also development of new materials. Um, we work with people like, uh, well, they're not called ELG anymore, but uh, we're working with the, the kind of people that are actually recycling uh, different materials. And we're working again with uh, Linea, for example, that uh, Stephen uh, mentioned, this company that was created up after Hyperdiv to actually make use of the recycling, the recycle fiber. So, in our case, we're more interested in the development of solutions once you get uh, the fibers, once you get the resins, uh, and uh, letting the experts on the on the material manufacturing do the their, their bit. I hope that answered the question. Uh, question from Yi: uh, How do you think about uh, thermoplastic development and sustainability? compared to bioresin and natural fibers, maybe it's more close to this application. So yeah, thermoplastics are definitely one of the focus. Uh, I have to say that, I mean, they're easier to recycle, but uh, it's not easy to recycle uh, thermoplastic composites. Uh, so we're doing quite a lot of work around there. So again, uh, finding the best possible ways of uh, going back to monomers uh, or finding uh, new thermoplastic materials. We are also working with uh, more uh, sustainable materials are not, are not necessarily easy, easier to recycle, so bioresins and natural fibers, but we see thermoplastic as a, as a one of the key areas where we want to focus uh, when we talk about uh, sustainability. We need to move on to the break now. Right. Yep. Thank no you worries. very much for answering the questions. Uh, you can answer the rest of the questions in the, ch in the chat just by typing an answer, if that's okay. Thank you, everyone, for your... Uh, Questions. We've now we're now taking a uh, a ten minute break, and then we're going to come back and we have a further update from the um, uh, uh, theme uh, leads. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to share some of the uh, news and updates about manufacturing and design theme in Bristol Composite Institute. Sorry. Uh, so for those of you who have a photographic memory and remember uh, a similar introduction slide that we showed last year. Uh, you can see that our uh, core staff team uh, became bigger and stronger. And this is uh, because we have uh, two new, very strong reinforcements in the group. Uh, these are Dr. Mark Alangana and Dr. General Jonathan Belno. Uh, though when I say new, I a little bit exaggerate because uh, Mark and Jonathan have been with us for quite a number of years, uh, and these new appointments uh, will allow them to consolidate their search and lead. There's uh, two very important areas uh, in the areas of sustainable manufacture, in the areas of uh, composites, uh, process modeling and simulations. Uh, the last uh, couple of years were uh, difficult uh, for us as for everybody else, but we kept on with, with our research, produced uh, quite a number of publications, co-authored with members of the structures team, uh, materials team, as well as a uh, wider uh, uh, network of our friends in the UK and uh, in the world. Um, I'll try to uh, present a, a bit of a digest of our uh, recent developments uh, as, as evidenced by our publications. And I decided that I will uh, 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 sort of group uh, all these developments into four main areas. This will be new manufacturing concepts. Uh, uh, it is traditional strength of Bristol Composite Institute. Uh, process modeling and analysis, uh, testing of composite precursors, uh, and manufacturing for uh, functional materials. So uh, in terms of uh, the manufacturing concepts, uh, the, there is a, a breadth of uh, uh, different developments, uh, uh, and the probably three, perhaps, uh, main themes in this area is development of manufacturing uh, capabilities for dealing with uh, 
sustainable uh, concepts for manufacturing uh, using using uh, uh, recycled materials and uh, natural fiber composites. Uh, these are robotics enhanced solutions, uh, which allow, for instance, uh, to fit uh, very uh, clever uh, end effectors that would allow to detect uh, the surface and the feature, uh, surface of a composite uh, as it laid up and uh, detect features on, the, on this uh, uh, surface. Uh, or there's a novel tape termination method that uh, allow for uh, automatic fiber placement uh, a technique to produce material with uh, better characteristics in terms of the, the, uh, the strength and resistance to the delamination. All these uh, concepts where uh, digital tools are incorporated as part of the manufacturing procedure and dictates how, for instance, the, the uh, composite should be steered uh, for the subsequent forming operations. Uh, on the side of processing analysis, uh, the research goes from very fundamental uh, uh, fundamentals of uh, uh, understanding the materials behavior and creating the models, creating physics-based models, to uh, sensing what happens in, in, in process, uh, to uh, optimizing the process with the model that, that we develop, and then envisaging new processes based on the capabilities that we, we developed and looking at the process that are uh, a very new, such as uh, alignment of uh, short fibers or printing of the discontinuous uh, reinforcements. Uh, in terms of the uh, functional materials, uh, we look at various different uh, applications uh, and we try to improve the electrical conductivity of the materials, uh, for instance, to, to improve uh, the sensing capabilities, to uh, make materials susceptible to inductive heating or to improve lightning strike protection. Uh, we also uh, have been looking at the, uh, uh, how the materials behave in uh, aggressive environments uh, and there's a research on how, for instance, to make these materials uh, more recyclable and, and compatible with recyclable manufacturing. Uh, Testing of composite precursors is a very important uh, area of uh, our research because the composite precursors are uh, capricious materials. Uh, they they are multi-phase, they exhibit various deformation and uh, uh, flow modes, uh, and we need to test them in manufacturing. So we need to understand how they behave at the point of, of deposition or consolidation. Uh, we need to think about how we can construct a testing procedure that will give uh, the required input for, for specific models. And so that requires developing new, new testing capabilities. And we also look how we can apply some of the advanced methods, uh, such as uh, 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 machine learning, uh, uh, in terms of understanding and making an objective assessment of the state of the material or uh, how the material behaves uh, and where we don't interfere with testing, where we let the system test the material uh, itself. Uh, there's an ongoing call for special issue and francis and materials uh, on mechanical testing of composite precursors. The call is open, so please, please join us there. There are a number of uh, platform collaborative grants that support all these developments. Uh, there is a, a project called Simprox uh, that is with us for, for a few years, uh, led by uh, Stephen Hallett, uh, where uh, we uh, bring together all various developments related to the modeling of the manufacturing process and uh, able to create a continuous chain of, sort of, of, of models from a stage of deposition to consolidation, uh, curing, and again, looking uh, ahead with uh, how we can deploy those tools to model the process that do not yet exist. These developments will be uh, taken forward in the new project called Made Faster, uh, that will uh, look at the uh, the, uh, creating the preforms uh, and focusing focusing on uh, textile based materials uh, in, in, again including the the whole chain of the manufacturing process that I needed to produce these composites. A uh, large project uh, led by uh, Ole Thompson uh, which examines the uh, certification for uh, design and a significant part uh, of, of that certification is how to how we certify the materials which have manufacturing features uh, uh, that uh, sometimes are inevitable in creation of composites. There's some of the example of simulations showing how the material deforms and flows in the complex part. 
A few ongoing pro uh, projects on uh, the position of fibers and processing. Uh, for instance, uh, Eric Kim uh, is examining how he can take his uh, advanced tau sharing concept feather and deposit over complex 3D co uh, composite structures. Uh, James Krauts, on the other hand, is looking at how we can understand more about the uh, deposition with conventional IP machines and developing tools that allow for real-time uh, real material measurements and assessing defects that occur, for instance, during steering. Uh, or there's a project AVOID, uh, which looks at how we uh, can deploy the complex uh, uh, modeling tools uh, uh, in aerodynamics to model occurrence of uh, voids and their development, development and growth. Uh, we are active in the IPSRC Future Composites Manufacturing Hub. Uh, we, we are involved in three core projects there with the University of Nottingham, the University of Cranfield, and with Imperial College London. Um, Eric, Jonathan, and Mark are, are, are conducting the project where they bring together the uh, HyperDiv preform deposited using tower steering technology and then deposited based on forming simulations and unforming simulations uh, in new, new digital concept. Uh, James, uh, together with Alex Cordes and Cranfield, showing how the uh, concept of uh, partial curing can de-risk and accelerate a, a cure for thick components, and then examining how a similar concept can be deployed to uh, uh, improve the manufacturing of a complex uh, 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 aerospace component. And uh, in our project with uh, Imperial College London, we look at the uh, man manufacturing, uh, manufacturability of the composites that are functionalized and also looking how we can uh, uh, functionalize the composite to make more efficient processing. This is a, a, have various applications. One of them is structural power application. And we are taking this project forward and preparing a new proposal based on that uh, together with the University of Durham, Imperial College London, and uh, there are a few uh, emerging projects uh, that uh, uh, where we uh, uh, think about uh, testing some of the uh, advanced uh, novel concept and looking how we can uh, expand our horizons. Uh, for instance, Jonathan will be uh, looking uh, at incorporating the parts of electrical uh, machines uh, into uh, composite reinforcement and that work will be done for the uh, future electrical machines manufacturing hub. Uh, in address, we will be looking at how we can use various uh, sustainable polymers and innovative processing techniques to create a novel repair concept. Um, and James and his team are looking in uh, uh, at, at creating new uh, uh, tools uh, for for composite manufacture. Uh, looking at this in in a feasibility study as well as an impact acceleration grant. So uh, let me stop uh, here. Uh, I uh, appreciate uh, your attention and your interest, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, if, you, if you have any, uh, perhaps beyond the scope of this presentation, uh, looking forward to interacting with you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce again the Matthias team of the BCI for this year. We are nine academics within the materials team. And our mission is to develop novel generation of composites. Uh, we use a broad range of multi-scale reinforcement from nanostructures to carbon, different classes of natural fibers. And we do the complete prototyping of these materials. Uh, so we start from the design, modeling, and manufacturing and testing of the material concepts that we develop. In terms of highlight uh, for this year, uh, well, we have produced uh, some quite good quality work uh, in uh, excellent uh, public, uh, publications uh, from Science, Carbon, uh, Applied Materials Today, the major composites uh, uh, journals, nanotechnologies, additive manufacturing, and also polymer cellulose lagmur. In terms of funding, this year we have managed to uh, obtain uh, the sorry. In terms of funding, uh, this year we have managed to obtain an EPSRC fellowship and also a ERC advance grant. 
And we have uh, also obtained other funding from the UK Space Agency, Rolls-Royce, NCC Pulfu, and uh, Enrique has already mentioned the collaboration that we have uh, with the NCC in terms of uh, pushing IRTRL levels for some uh, configurations of materials and structures that we develop. Also, uh, uh, Society of Chemistry Enablement Grant. Another major milestone has been the spin out of linear composites. And Stephen has already mentioned this, uh, this happened in the, during the summer. And uh, some of us have been also involved in uh, keynotes to international conferences and, and workshops. I mentioned already some so prestigious uh, fellowships that uh, we have secured within the team. Uh, let me start with the EPSRC fellowship from Professor Stephen Eichhorn. Uh, uh, the fellowship is related to the development of realizing functional cellulose biobased composites, but there are very strong elements also the quality, diversity, and inclusion focus especially with the uh, aim to improve the experience inclusion of black students and staff. I've been uh, uh, quite lucky to obtain a, a ERC uh, advanced grant. Uh, is the work is related to the development of natural neuroactive mechanical metamaterials, uh, and this is a work that is done in collaboration with uh, my colleague Adam Perlman at the School of uh, Cellular and Molecular Medicine. But we have also an international consortium that uh, will help us to uh, develop uh, these classes of metamaterials with uh, uh, different biobased components, but also using natural uh, sourced materials and also uh, uh, locally sourced manufacturing techniques. Another uh, major milestone for this year uh, has been led by Professor Ian Amerton. Uh, Ian has led a group of uh, uh, students, also academics from the team, also outside the team, uh, to develop uh, uh, new classes, uh, classes of uh, composites with uh, post reinforcements, especially for uh, 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 to, com to combat atomic oxygen, uh, uh, cosmic uh, and the UV and uh, uh, space environmental uh, uh, radiation. Those composites should fly next spring on the International Space Station. So you know not only for the team, but also for the Institute of the World University. This is a, a major milestone and event. Something that also we have uh, uh, developed this year is uh, an internal workshop uh, between the Bristol Composite Institutes and uh, uh, Bristol Biodesign Institute. And we have put together uh, so, um, groups of uh, academics from synthetic biology and also from the Institute more working towards the sustainable uh, materials and uh, uh, bio-inspired materials. So we want to really to, to create an interface of design space between synthetic biology and uh, uh, material sust sustainability. And that has also led to the development of a transition award within the uh, engineering biology program. So we are uh, waiting for the outcome of this uh, uh, proposal that we have submitted. There are also some other uh, papers that uh, I like really to uh, highlight. Um, there is this very excellent paper that I really invite, invite you to read about uh, the creation of a roadmap for the realization of aircraft components with electrical and structural multifunctionality. Uh, some, uh, some people, some members of the, of the group, uh, like Ian Amert and Richard Trask have been involved, but also Juliana Allegri from, uh, from the other team. It is a paper full of uh, uh, very in interesting data matrix and design guidelines. And I think really it will be quite cited in the field for the time being. 
Another uh, quite interesting paper that has been uh, produced uh, with the team is the effect of pore geometry on ultra densified hydrogen in microporous carbons. And this is a work led by uh, Sebastian uh, Rocha and uh, Navaleska. Uh, thing and it's a very interesting paper that combines in situ neutral scattering other uh, experimental techniques also molecular modeling to uh, uh, investigate the effects of the pore in uh, microporous carbon to uh, capture ultra densified hydrogen and another paper uh, that I would like also to mention is the fruit of a collaboration uh, with our uh, partners at Zhejiang uh, University. Uh, we have a PhD collaboration between the Institute uh, and, and them. And we have developed this uh, uh, artificial uh, surrogate of the CATPO. Uh, is a material with uh, extremely interesting energy absorbing capabilities for uh, uh, for sports, engineering, and other types of upper end uh, config uh, configurations. But the hallmark of, uh, of this year is certainly goes really to uh, Steve Icorn and uh, his colleagues, especially from the University of Maryland. Uh, Steve and colleagues have uh, developed this uh, technique to create strong and moldable wood materials with a rapid water shock process, in essence, they dismantle the wood's linen, and the linen the softer than actually the wood. They close the fibers with reparation, so the wood is swelled then by uh, a shock uh, blast with water. And the result in the free dimension of all the wood is six times stronger than uh, the starting wood, and it can be also comparable to lightweight materials, also like aluminum alloys. Uh, uh, I'm sure that this is a paper that not only will be heavily cited, but will really uh, inspire quite a lot of researchers in the field. So Steve and colleagues really are, uh, deserve a massive round of applause for that. I'll now uh, introduce some new uh, members of staff and also provide some updates uh, from uh, the academics in involved in the team. First, let me introduce Dr. Uh, Nia Chandarana. Uh, uh, Nia has been already partially introduced before, but she comes from the composite group in uh, Manchester and uh, uh, she's a lecturer in bio-based and sustainable composites. Her major in terms of research is about the fusion of acoustic emission monitoring and the finite element simulation for the damage characteristics. She, is, uh, she has also worked on in situ stream monitoring with the use of distributed optical fiber sensor. She plans uh, obviously to uh, apply uh, this type of techniques uh, to uh, biobased uh, natural fiber composites. And we all know that uh, these type of composites are extremely interesting uh, in terms of really of uh, um, solving issues related to structural integrity. And quite sure that uh, NIA's techniques will be quite helpful to, uh, to uh, advance the use of, of those type of composites. Already mentioned that Professor Ian Hamilton has been uh, quite uh, busy this year in uh, providing uh, 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 new types of solutions in the field of uh, uh, material science. Uh, we have already uh, mentioned uh, uh, the linear composites. Uh, the company is very much based uh, on the uh, development of the hyperdiff technology that has been mentioned before. And uh, now there, is, there are major locations of hyperdiff 3G within the uh, DNCC. And there have been also quite other activities related to uh, the development of uh, the hyperdiff uh, technique, also in a recycle uh, carbon fiber laminates, and also uh, development of LCA data related to that. Uh, the effect of plasma on the structural integrity of carbon fiber epoxy and dynema laminates has been also uh, studied uh, this year uh, by uh, Usman uh, Sikander, part of a, a, a group uh, uh, led by Ian. 
uh, Matt Bone, another EMS PhD student, uh, uh, has developed some uh, molecular dynamic simulation for the polyurethane coating co uh, coalescence. Other work has been going on for uh, 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 adhesives, uh, the smart adhesives, but uh, Jack, uh, Jack is good enough. And then uh, also other work uh, has been going on in terms of uh, assessment of uh, uh, manufacturing aspects for a particular uh, uh, type of uh, uh, composite uh, uh, configuration. And also the development of wheelchair ramp uh, infused with uh, uh, re um, a recycled carbon fiber. First, we have uh, uh, Gemma Ronaldson. Dr. Gemma Ronaldson is a new member of staff for sustainable uh, materials and method optimization. And uh, I think really in terms of group, we are really moving towards a multidiscipl multidisciplinary outlook. We have a strong push towards sustainability and we are open to widespread national and international collaboration. And uh, we are also close alignment with industrial NCC core research programs. If you have any question, please feel free also to put them in the q and A. I'll be quite happy to do it. Thank you very much. I'm going to present a brief overview of the uh, activity of the uh, structures team of the Bristol Composite Institute. Uh, so the structures team uh, comprises uh, uh, 12 academics and uh, our research is uh, mainly oriented towards uh, the understanding, uh, characterization and prediction of the mechanical performance of uh, composites via novel numerical methods, uh, novel structural configurations, advanced analysis techniques, and we are also trying to embrace uh, uh, multifunctionality and uh, uh, data-rich uh, experimentation. Uh, we are delighted uh, to uh, welcome uh, uh, Dr. Rainer Grow as a lecturer in digital engineering of structures. Um, so that uh, Rainer Gro uh, will uh, be is a member of the Bristol Composite Institute, uh, and they will give a, a strong contribution uh, to the structures team. Uh, Dr. Gro holds a PhD in Advanced Composite from uh, the University of Bristol, and uh, prior uh, to his uh, uh, lectureship, uh, he also held uh, a research fellowship from the Royal Academy of Engineering. Uh, Rainer's key research interests are the, uh, instabi the instability uh, analysis from a computational perspective, uh, the uh, design and optimization of lightweight structures, and the development of uh, uh, testing control algorithms for uh, uh, the testing of uh, highly nonlinear structure. And there is a research also involved uh, uh, applications to uh, biomechanics and uh, uh, biomimetics. Uh, Dr. Bassam El Said has been uh, awarded an EPSSC uh, New Investigator Grant. Uh, his uh, research will focus on the uh, multi scale modeling of 3D uh, woven structures, uh, employing uh, uh, unsupervised uh, machine learning uh, to recognize uh, clusters uh, within 3D woven materials uh, across uh, the uh, scales. Uh, and this is a project that will last two years uh, and uh, has a strong uh, uh, industrial partnership with the Rolls-Royce BA Systems and uh, the NCC. Um, in terms of other uh, uh, awards, uh, Irene Jimenez Fortunato uh, won the best paper uh, competition at the, at the last contest uh, conference for her work on uh, improved, uh, the understand, improving the understanding of the uh, thermoelastic response of orthotropic composite laminates. Uh, Professor Janice Barton delivered a keynote at the 16th International Conference on uh, uh, engineering structural integrity uh, assessment. And this keynote focused on the uh, full field uh, imaging techniques for the uh, integrity assessment of composite structures. And finally, uh, Dr. Ben Woods, together with uh, uh, Professor uh, 
uh, uh, with, with, uh, together with Dr. Tom Randall and Professor Jonathan Cooper, was awarded a contract for uh, uh, the design of morphing wings for uh, hydrogen powered aircrafts uh, within uh, uh, the framework of the uh, UK uh, Flight Zero uh, initiative. Um, there's been uh, um, um, a series of uh, uh, online uh, workshops organized by uh, Professor uh, Michael Wisdom from BCI in collaboration with uh, Professor Waltz from uh, KU Levin and Professor Federico Paris from the University of Seville. Uh, the last work workshop focused on uh, essentially the challenges associated with measuring unidirectional uh, uh, compressive uh, strength. And um, uh, this workshop is uh, uh, the last in a series of three, uh, with the uh, previous two held in uh, 2021 and the spring of 2021 and the fall of 2020. Uh, and those were about measuring uh, uh, tensile strength and actually defining uh, strength in composites, which continues to be uh, quite elusive property. Uh, these uh, uh, workshops were uh, uh, very well attended, and uh, if you are interested in uh, essentially, uh, well, attending the workshops in an asynchronous fashion, the recordings are um, available on the uh, BCI YouTube channel. So in terms of industrial collaboration, we have uh, uh, two flagship activities. The first one if, is the Windblade uh, Research Hub, which involves a partnership between the University of Bristol and the ORI uh, Catapult. Um, the, Windblade, uh, uh, the Windblade Research Hub is led by Professor Paul Weaver and uh, Dr. Alberto Pirrera and involves about 20 UOB researchers and uh, academics. Uh, there are a wide range of uh, uh, projects uh, spanning uh, land scales uh, from uh, atoms to uh, full uh, uh, composite uh, blades and uh, uh, disciplines from materials to manufacturing and of course aeroelastic design. Uh, the latest projects uh, involve uh, uh, the study of uh, segmented blades and uh, uh, the uh, development and application of unified uh, um, structural models. Uh, the wind blade research hub is supported by uh, a wide uh, network involving both uh, industrial partners such as Vester, Vestas, um, uh, the NCC of course, and uh, academic partners uh, such as Imperial College. More in detail about the technical highlights, there is an ongoing collaboration uh, between the Hub and Imperial College on uh, uh, the development of novel, uh, novel blade topologies for uh, uh, additive manufacturing. Uh, there is also an ongoing uh, collaboration with the University of Limerick on the health uh, monitoring of uh, wind turbine blades and uh, with Strathclyde uh, investigating uh, uh, recycling uh, methods for uh, materials in wind turbine blades. Um, also, the hub is uh, uh, working in partnership with uh, NCC and the Ori Catapult uh, to um, further uh, uh, identify the potential for the application of uh, advanced composites in uh, the next generation of floating uh, turbines. And uh, there is also activity ongoing on developing uh, blade concepts for uh, um, wind turbines with an energy ratings of uh, uh, 20 megawatts. Uh, as part of the uh, activity uh, of the hub, uh, a seminar on uh, sustainable composites uh, for uh, wind turbine blades uh, has been held in September this year, and this involved 
two technical sessions and 10 presentations uh, from uh, researchers from BCI, the University of Cambridge and the University of Limerick. The seminar also had a strong industrial steer with contributions from uh, Vestas, Siemens, EDF and um, Airy Composites. And again, the uh, recording of uh, uh, this uh, networking seminar is available on the uh, BCI YouTube channel. Uh, the second uh, flagship activity that we have is uh, the uh, Bristol Composites UTC, uh, supported by Rolls-Royce. This is a very large and active program uh, involving uh, eight BCI academics, uh, 10 RAs and 12 uh, PhD students and three uh, RHD research engineers. Current research areas uh, uh, involve the uh, study of environmental aging on the fracture and fatigue behavior of polymer based composites, novel through thickness reinforcement uh, architectures for the lamination suppression. Um, also, we are actively investigating uh, uh, the uh, failure analysis uh, uh, of polymer and ceramic uh, matrix composites with the multi scale computational methods. And in the last year, we have been also uh, quite active uh, on the uh, structural design of uh, solutions for uh, hydrogen storage, both uh, gaseous and uh, liquid, so uh, cryogenic storage. Um, in terms of uh, technical highlights, I would like to point the attention uh, on a paper that we uh, recently published uh, about embedding artificial neural networks in uh, cohesive uh, zone uh, models to uh, predict uh, fatigue delamination growth under a wide range of mode mixities and uh, stress ratios and also under uh, non-proportional uh, loading conditions. So, uh, as an overall summary, uh, the structures team at this stage comprises 35 uh, researchers and about 30 PhD students. We have a world class range of uh, activities uh, ranging from uh, blue sky uh, investigations to uh, actual full scale engineering applications. And of course, our mission is to deliver uh, innovative solutions and technology uh, for industrial partners. Uh, so we are, uh, uh, of course, open to uh, new opportunities for uh, um, novel research projects and uh, uh, technology transfer uh, to <coughs> partners. By seeing what, uh, or by talking about what net zero is. Uh, so, the, the idea of net zero is that our, our planet is in, in quite a, a delicate ecological balance. So uh, by, well, since the industrial revolution, we've played a part in, uh, in promoting a lot of uh, global emissions through just our, our daily, uh, uh, our, our industry, our, our transportation around the globe. And net zero is this concept that, that all of the emissions that, um, that humans generate over time uh, should be balanced out by the, the emissions that are captured. Uh, for example, in natural carbon sinks, like the, uh, like the sea or through biomass, for example, trees and, and rainforests. And, and so net zero is this, this concept that our emissions out are balanced by our emissions that are captured, and therefore we're, we're having minimal impact on the planet. Um, so these, the reason that we are interested in, in keeping this net zero balance is because of the effects of climate change. Uh, so these can be anything from, uh, from increased temperatures and in increased incidence of, of uh, extreme weather events, uh, forest fires, for example, in some parts of, of the globe, to uh, increased rainfall, uh, and also uh, a, a more frequent uh, extreme weather event like, the, like um, tornadoes, hurricanes, in other parts of the globe. Uh, in addition, the the global warming of, of our environment or, or, um, or the effects of climate change can affect wildlife, for example, melting of polar ice caps and also bleaching of coral reefs. So you can see that the impacts of, of climate change through our, our emissions 
uh, is, is quite significant. Uh, and it also uh, the, the effects are quite varied. And, and so the, the idea is that the emissions that we're, that we're generating are creating a, a blanket uh, in, in our atmosphere around the earth and, and causing this uh, global temperature rise. So the question for engineers and scientists and everyone at the moment is, is what can we do about it? Uh, so the, the thing that's happening at the moment that, that is, is quite pertinent to this, this panel is that we've got the, um, the COP26 conference. So the, the UN um, conference on climate change, which is happening in Glasgow at the moment. And one of the things that uh, the governments around the world are trying to identify is what they can do about the, uh, the emissions that we're creating through industry, through heating uh, and domestic energy use and through transportation uh, and how we can, can limit those, uh, those emissions or mitigate against them uh, so that we can achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Now, for those of you who have been following the COP26 conference, one of the biggest uh, announcements uh, of the past week uh, has been uh, when Boris Johnson was talking about uh, the UK's approach to getting to, to net zero. And he, he flagged up hydrogen as one of the options uh, for being able to, to reach our uh, quite ambitious net zero targets. So what's the deal with hydrogen? Why are we interested in it? Um, well, first of all, it's it's a very high, uh, or it's it's the most energy dense uh, chemical fuel that we have available to us on a kilogram basis. So one kilogram of hydrogen holds as much energy as uh, as three kilograms of, of petrol. Now, uh, but in addition to that, hydrogen is the uh, the most abundant uh, element in the universe, and it can be generated from uh, renewable electricity. For example, so if you have access to sunlight or, or wind power and you have access to, to water, then you can generate hydrogen. So, so one of the benefits is that uh, any nation in the world should have access to those starting materials. And so, uh, so it can make energy generation far more equitable, independent of geography. Uh, Another aspect is that when you use hydrogen either in a combustion cell, uh, combustion engine or a fuel cell, then the only emission that you generate is, um, is pure water. Uh, so water is, is H2O, it's hydrogen and oxygen. And so, so uh, hydrogen can be a zero carbon fuel if, if the cycle is managed correctly. Um, so what, what we're looking at is, is how uh, composites might be able to uh, contribute to the, um, to the implementation of hydrogen as a way of reaching net zero. Uh, so there are three main aspects that I want to look at today um, and that we want to explore during the panel. Uh, one is the use of, of hydrogen in, uh, in sustainable energy generation. A second is as a way of balancing the grid, so, so uh, tensioning energy generation with energy demand uh, so that we can have energy available as and when we, we need it. And the third area is in uh, the application of sustainable transport. Uh, so how can we uh, retain our global mobility um, without contributing to the climate crisis? So just giving a brief overview of, of those three areas. Um, if we look at hydrogen for, for sustainable energy generation, where, where hydrogen fits is that if you, uh, if you look at solar power or wind generated electricity, the, the issue with these um, sustainable energy sources is that they're inherently inter intermittent. So the sun doesn't always shine, uh, the, the wind doesn't always blow. And so hydrogen is a way of being able to take this renewable electricity. If you pass it through water, which remember is H2O, then you can split the water electrolytically and generate uh, hydrogen and oxygen. And then you can collect the hydrogen. And because it's a gas, because it's something physical, we can put it into a tank and store it uh, and then uh, use it when, as and when we want to. So it's a way of balancing this, this uh, uh, production of renewable energy and, uh, and being able to store it 
for later use. Uh, so there's been a lot of talk about the, the types of hydrogen that have been generated. So at the moment, 90% of, of the hydrogen that we use is made from non-renewable sources. So from steam methane reforming, for example. Um, but the, this equation that I'm, I'm showing at the top of the page is, is a, a way of generating green hydrogen and increasing the, uh, the penetration of renewable electricity that we, that we have in, uh, in the UK and indeed around the world. Uh, so another aspect is that, that you can also make hydrogen uh, as a byproduct or, or we call it cogeneration uh, with other fuel um, uh, or other uh, energy generation methods such as nuclear. So you can take the waste heat from nuclear, use it to generate hydrogen uh, again through, um, uh, through splitting water or, or other uh, starting products that are rich in hydrogen. Uh, and so, so there's a, a, a real focus on developing technologies for the generation of green hydrogen. So we're all here uh, to, um, because we have an interest in composites. So how can composites help? Uh, well, first of all, uh, the, there have been a, a, a few talks uh, that have mentioned wind power. And of course, composites make uh, wind turbine blades that are as, as, as large as they are, they make them possible because uh, composites are, are lightweight and directionally very strong. Uh, so by improving composites design and, and also manufacture, we can get larger and more efficient wind turbine blades. And the UK is actually leading the world in, in terms of um, offshore renewable energy generation. And so we're, we're, uh, we're in a very strong starting position there. In addition, uh, solar panels, you may not think about it, but they're composite materials. Uh, and so, so the development of, of more efficient solar panels, solar panels that are flexible, lightweight, more durable, and can be, um, can be put in, in, uh, in different places to, to generate uh, electricity. That, that's a, a real area of um, research development. Uh, in addition, uh, the development of photocatalysts that can, uh, that can generate hydrogen uh, using sunlight. So that's the photo part of the photocatalysts. Um, so generally you need a catalyst plus you need a catalyst support. So these are, are nanocomposite materials and the, the development of the composite makes, it, uh, makes the photocatalyst more efficient and, and also uh, increases their... Um, uh, their ability to generate hydrogen. And finally, fuel cells, which take the hydrogen and convert it back into electricity, they're also uh, composites and they use composite parts. Uh, and so, so everything about these, these uh, different ways of generating and using hydrogen uh, could benefit from development in composites. Uh, so that, that's a generation of, of, um, of power. What about the storage of renewable energy? Because as I mentioned, there's, there's no good way to, to store renewable en um, energy on a grid scale. Uh, so batteries don't scale up enough. Um, a, a lot of countries don't have the geography to be able to use pump hydro. And so there's this, this issue of uh, if the sun isn't shining, will you be able to turn on your lights? Uh, so hydrogen comes in because when you, you use your excess renewable electricity to generate hydrogen, so, so if you're generating a lot of wind power at a time when there's low demand, you can take that electricity, turn it into hydrogen, and then use it for, for things like the domestic heating or to, to power your, your cars. Um, so the, the benefit of, um, of generating this, this uh, renewable hydrogen is that um, then you can start piping it into the gas grid, for example, to, um, and, and because hydrogen is a zero carbon fuel, uh, any mixture of, uh, of hydrogen with your natural gas will lower the, the carbon emissions. Uh, and so if you do want to modify your, um, your national uh, gas pipeline to be able to handle hydrogen, that's where composite materials come in. Uh, hydrogen is very small and it's it's very mobile, and so uh, and in addition, you you have uh, issues with, um, for example, embrittlement or um, or uh, interactions of the hydrogen um, with certain metals, and so so having uh, composite linings, composite um, 
uh, composite pipes will will help to um, will help to develop that infrastructure to allow mixing of hydrogen with natural gas um, for domestic heating and domestic use. In addition, uh, we we can also not only look at, at national use of hydrogen, but international uh, export and import of, um, of renewably generated hydrogen. And one way of doing this that's been, um, that's been explored in countries in the Middle East, where they have a lot of sunshine and a lot of solar, uh, solar hydrogen generation, is, um, is the conversion of hydrogen into something like ammonia, which is NH3. It's very hydrogen rich, but it's um, because it, it, it can be a liquid. It's, um, uh, it's, it's not as, uh, as flammable or as, uh, as escapable as, as hydrogen is. Uh, it's, it's slightly easier to carry around, but we know that ammonia is quite corrosive. And so uh, composite tanks for carrying around uh, either uh, liquid hydrogen or hydrogen in the form of ammonia uh, would be very valuable for allowing this, this uh, balancing of, of uh, renewable electricity supply with demand. Uh, the last area is, is looking at hydrogen for sustainable transport. Uh, so the benefits of hydrogen for sustainable transport uh, is that uh, you have zero carbon emissions. Uh, and something to note is that hydrogen should be complementary to electrification. So there are um, there are absolutely applications that, that lend themselves to, uh, to batteries. So short range battery electric vehicles, for example, uh, electrification of, of, of trains, electrification of, of uh, short haul flights. Um, but there are some applications where, um, where you need that extra range or that extra, um, extra power. And, and so you want to look at applications where, where hydrogen has an added bonus uh, or there's a reason for using hydrogen rather than uh, than a battery, uh, and so so we're looking at applications where um, where batteries can't uh, deliver the energy that we need. Um, the other aspect is is that because there's so much momentum at the moment behind uh, implementation of, of hydrogen, we're looking at radical new designs and radical ways of, of um, storing the hydrogen on board. Uh, on board vehicles and looking at how we can make the design of, of new cars, new planes more efficient while keeping out our emissions very, very low. Uh, so again, where, where do composites come in? Well, uh, if you look at the, the state of the art for, for hydrogen buses, this is actually um, uh, uh, quite an, uh, an old example where we're looking at the hydrogen buses in, in London and the these tanks on the roof of the bus are where they stored the hydrogen either as a, a highly um, compressed gas at around 350 or 700 times atmospheric pressure um, or you can you can store your hydrogen as a, a cryogenic liquid at around 20 kelvin so each of those sets of conditions has uh, uh, has its drawbacks. So for example, these, these uh, are, are quite thick walled steel tanks on the tops of this bus. Um, and, uh, and they're quite heavy and cumbersome to carry around. So ideally we'd want to go to a lightweight composite tank um, because if you're looking at mobile applications on cars and planes, uh, a weight saving is a fuel saving. In addition, if you can lower the pressure at which you, you store the hydrogen, or, uh, or you can store it at a, uh, conditions closer to ambient. Uh, you've, got, you've got safety advantages. And using composites, you can start to look at multifunctionality. So incorporating sensing, incorporating um, uh, additional energy recovery and, and thermodynamic um, benefits, uh, all in the, same, in the same tank through your tank design. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities for, for developing composite materials. Um, that would benefit uh, onboard hydrogen storage. Uh, so there are still some challenges. So the first of them is the scale. So the scale at which we need to generate the hydrogen to, to power a country, the scale at which we need to develop these composites to, to make enough uh, wind turbine blades, enough tanks uh, uh, for these very large scale applications. So scale is, is, is one aspect. A second one is that you can't develop um, one of these technologies in isolation. It has to be part of an infrastructure 
Uh, you need, uh, for example, if you've got hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, you need the refueling infrastructure. It's got to be part of a system. Uh, and the third aspect is looking at the public acceptance of hydrogen uh, and then tackling that, uh, that reticence that comes with a new technology. Um, but hopefully that's what, what this panel will, will uh, hope to address or help to address. Uh, so if we want to move away from, uh, from or back from the brink of this climate catastrophe, uh, then, then hydrogen is, is really a, a fantastic option for, um, for looking at ways that we can reduce our emissions uh, and, and still, um, still retain a, a lot of the, um, the technologies that we've, um, we've spent a lot of time investing in. Uh, and we're going to explore this more during the panel discussion. So if you're at all interested in uh, the net zero uh, initiatives or in hydrogen, then please come and join us at 1.30 p.m. Thank you. For uh, inviting me to give this, this talk, um, um, Equitable and Sustainable Composites for the Future. Um, I, I want to emphasize the word equitable. Um, because really this is what we're trying to achieve and some, some of what um, Valeska just said before, I want to sort of emphasize a little bit more. Um, but to start with, we, we live in confusing times, it seems. Um, there was a radio program the other day, I don't know if anybody heard about this, but um, there was an Insulate Britain protester talking about um, his, his profession, which was carpentry. And uh, the interviewer says, uh, was trying to sort of advocate um, that he was he was you know doing damage to the environment by by, by his profession, and uh, and and he said well actually concrete's the biggest um, one of the biggest emitters of carbon dioxide, and and can't be grown on trees and and uh, the interviewer said yes it can so I don't know there seems to be a lack of understanding sometimes uh, amongst the general public about what 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 constitutes sustainable materials and what what is possible. Um, I saw this advert as well about new robot trees um, in Cork City streets. So this is uh, um, um, artificial trees being being put into the into the city to try and clean the air. Whereas actually, you can just see behind here, there's some actual trees that probably do just as good as job. So what about the implications? I'm, I don't want to sort of really push this too much because uh, Valeska's um, uh, said very clearly, but the Paris Agreement on climate change. Um, it aimed to keep the global average temperatures well below two degrees C warming compared to pre-industrial levels, but we aim to pursue to keep it to 1.5. Now we're only, we're really already experiencing devastating impacts at one degree warming. In fact, it's 1.2, I think. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has made it clear that increases of more than 1.5 would be absolutely catastrophic. And we can't really emphasize that uh, anymore. Um, and so far we're falling far short of the 1.5 or even the two degree target. And, 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 and this is quite, this is, this is extremely worrying. Um, and I think we need to stop burying our heads in the sand really over this and, and start working more uh, 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 strongly to try and, and, and reduce emissions, as, as uh, Valeska has pointed out. And, um, you know, I think sometimes we're kicking the can down the road. I won't really mention COP26, but, but essentially some of the targets that are being set are really about sort of putting that off into the future when we don't really have that time to do this. And of course there are huge devastating uh, climatic events that are happening and they are increasing you can read about them here um, it's a fact floods forest fires and biodiversity loss um, and we're seeing some of the highest temperatures uh, ever to be recorded um, in in many many parts of the world not just not just in certain parts of the world in in, in all parts of the world now, one of, what's the problem with our material cycle as far as the composites industry is concerned? Well, we get most of our materials from composites with the reliance on oil, and, um, and that's a fact. Um, Stanford University um, did some research and found that oil fields uh, produce greenhouse gases to equivalent to 1.7 gigatons of carbon dioxide, roughly 5% of all emissions 
and fuel combustion that year. And, but actually, it's thought that it's actually quite, quite a lot higher because the analysis doesn't fully capture all the emissions. And in fact, methane is also um, um, uh, released into the atmosphere when, when we extract oil. So there is a drive to decarbonise energy, but to reduce our reliance on petroleum. You can see here the number of electric vehicles worldwide is increasing dramatically. And the divestment in fossil fuels is increasing. It's slowly, and it's perhaps not fast enough, but it is nevertheless increasing. And this is the key point here. The only reason why we make plastics from oil is a convenience on the back of oil production for fuel. It's a very, very small part, actually, of the use of oil is actually going into, into materials. But all of our materials in composites pretty much rely on oil. So what is sustainable? Well, we need to think about that in, in, in quite a detailed way. Um, but before we do that, it's not just about things. It's not just about materials. It's also about people. People are involved in this. And Brundtland defined sustainable development as, as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the needs of future generations. But actually, there are global disparities in the world. Um, and, and they've been shaped pretty much by empire. We talked about the Industrial Revolution, but that was built on the backs of slavery and, and various other um, uh, extractive economy, economic uh, drives to, to generate wealth in the West. And of course, through that came um, uh, pollution, and, 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 and of course, that has generated um, uh, the, the global um, the, the climate change that we're seeing now. And um, so we sit in the present time with this, with this very great disparity that actually it's the countries that were exploited that are going to receive um, the, the hardest in, in edge of, of, of climate change. So we need to break down what sustainable is really just into people and things and, 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 and they're not unconnected. So there are non-renewable resources like oil, oil, coal and natural gas. There are renewable uh, sources of, 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 of materials such as timber, plants and, and wool here. Um, and there are replenishable resources, water, soil and air. And we need to sustain all of these in a sustainability situation. Now I work on cellulose and cellulose is nature's wonder material. It's produced by this equation here, which is the most important equation uh, to human life, not just plant life, because in the sequestering of carbon dioxide and its, and its combination with water, we generate um, glucose here, which is polymerized into cellulose, but also oxygen here, we generate the clean air that we breathe. And, and life on Earth just would not be possible without us. And it does it all year round, spring, summer, autumn, winter, to use our temperate climate. And uh, we generate trees and plant life all year round. But what about plants and trees? Well, they, can't, they capture carbon, which is really important. So we can actually capture carbon dioxide from, from, from the Earth's atmosphere. We can, trees have actually been shown to be able to um, in, enhance that. If there's, a, there's an excess of carbon dioxide, they can actually increase the growth to, 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 to capture more carbon. They're biodegradable, um, so they return to the Earth. They're sustainable. They're structural, so they produce structural materials, which I'll talk about later. They provide clean air for us, and they're cooling. They provide a cool environment for us. And they're calming as well. It's nice to walk into a forest and, 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 and be calmed by that. And they're living structures. And actually, the word material divide, derives from the word Latin word materia for trunk of tree, and that actually derives from the word mater, which means mother, and that connects us to what we call Mother Earth. So actually, it's... It's something that we've been connected to for a long period of time throughout our history. But what can we produce from biomass, from woody biomass and plant biomass? We can produce all kinds of things. There's a little cartoon here showing some of the things, packaging. We can produce composites for cars. We can produce paints and emulsions. Uh, we can produce all kinds of things, actually. Uh, bone implants from, um, from, from, from cellulose. Plastics and polymers can come from trees. We can produce paper, we can produce fuels, carbon fibres we can make from, from cellulose. We've known that for a long time. 
emulsions and paints, construction materials, composites, uh, batteries, filtration media, solar cells, all of these things can actually produce from the primary source cellulose. So actually we can produce a lot of the commodity products that we have today, including composites from, from this biomass source, biomedical implants, I put that. So what about returning to a biomass based economy? Why we did actually come from that um, point at, at one time, we were very connected to wood. In fact, even in this country, in the early 20th century, Ackland, um, which was a, who was a landowner in Exeter, near Exeter, was, was put in charge of looking at how much biomass was available in the UK. And uh, that, that uh, led to the setup of the Forestry Commission. So we were actually concerned at one time about how much biomass we had in order to contribute to, to the economy. And in fact, predating that, um, obviously, uh, during the, the wars that we had, many wars with the Spanish and the French, we, we grew trees in order to, to, to build ships for, 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 our, for our Navy. But what about the trees? Okay, well, what, what, what are we doing about tree growth? Um, well, we're currently only using about 20% of what's called the boreal forest for the production of materials. And a lot of this boreal forest is, is sustainable. We can actually regrow the trees um, over, over just over an annual cycle. And in fact, there's huge amounts of um, waste uh, biomass. This is a, a sugarcane uh, bagasse pile in Brazil. These are some trucks here. And uh, there's a huge amount of waste material that, that is being, not being used actually, it's just being piled up. So I think, you know, we could grow more trees. And in fact, there was this article in the BBC um, about uh, growing more homegrown timber to cut emissions, so planting forests. Um, and, uh, and, and you can read about that there, and I think it's really important that we might start doing this. Um, we give China a bad rap sometimes, but actually they're doing great, making great strides in terms of growing trees. They've been growing uh, uh, just over four and a half thousand kilometer area, of one billion, hundred billion trees in northern China to prevent, prevent desertification in the Gobi Desert. This point here is a, it's an actual point on the graph uh, denoting where China are in terms of their afforestation compared to deforestation compared to all uh, a load of other countries and actually it's China that's standing out in terms of that and the Prime Minister of our own country he, he made an election pledge to grow the more than 30,000 hectares of trees by 2024 actually the number of trees planted in the UK fell last year the number that we actually planted so we're not really hitting those targets but tree planting actually has, um, it's quite divisive in certain parts of the country. Um, monocultures aren't what we're looking for. So we have in this country tended to go for monocultural planting, but actually we do need um, multi, um, um, many different types of trees to be planted in order to protect habitats. But actually it might sound nice to plant trees and there's this Twitter here about um, a tribesman who's been, um, his for generations have been, have been uh, working the land um, in, in, in Malaysia. And um, planting trees might sound nice, but um, if you produce monocultures, uh, you push out tribes and you break down the biodiversity that you need to retain the planet. So it's not just about planting trees. But what do we do with the converted biomass if we're making uh, composites? Now, a lot of people have um, um, find these sorts of images um, uh, distressing that we're just burying these um, wind turbines. But actually, I've got an alternative uh, approach that we could be uh, taking, and uh, it comes via a friend of mine, uh, Professor Tony Ryan, who gave a talk um, earlier last year on sustainable composites. What if we took biomass and converted the, that to plastics. And then once we've used those plastics, we bury them in the ground and we return that carbon then back into the cycle. So instead of taking oil out of the ground, which by the way, originally was biomass, okay? Um, but taking the uh, direct conversion of sunlight uh, and carbon dioxide and water to capture the carbon into plants, generating plastics, and then making uh, composite material, but then returning those to the ground uh, to ultimately return the carbon back into the system. And this is a this is an email. I'm just going to take a few some email that uh, Tony sent to me. 
So we're not taking carbon that was fixed millennia, uh, millennia ago, but taking carbon in the present. And he reckons we could sequester a gigaton of carbon dioxide a year uh, once we've decarbonized heat. So we actually need to de decarbonize our energy as Valeska was advocating to wind and, um, and solar. And the petrochemicals industry would benefit. It would keep its capital assets. It would be persuaded to leave oil and gas in the ground, okay, which is what we need to do in terms of climate change. But we could see profit from a consume and conserve plastic policy. And actually, this last sentence is really important. We could actually um, uh, use it to, 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 to replace even more materials, carbon fibre composites, where both the fibre and the resin were what we call neocarbon, new carbon, they're not uh, from oil, and it could replace lightweight metals in transport and steel and construction. So, so actually not going away from this, actually burying our composites in the ground and, and returning them back into, back into the, the carbon cycle. To it. But what will happen to our waste? That's quite a, an, an, an ideal situation, but we've not got a great record when it comes to waste. In fact, it only came to light in 2018 when China banned uh, uh, foreign waste from entering into, into China. And the UK uh, exports a huge amount of domestic and industrial waste to all these countries here. Um, also, nuclear waste has been dumped off Somalia in many clandestine waste since the 1980s. So what will happen to the next generation of material waste? We need some kind of equitable waste management whereby which countries um, developing countries don't don't end up taking our trash uh, as they have done previously. And what about sustainability goals? How does the drive towards sustainable composites map onto these SDGs? There are 17 of them. Um, are there any tensions or conflicts? And how can sustainable composites help us attain the SDGs? Are our targets realistic? And how resilient is our industry to changing public opinions and behaviour? And are we promoting an equitable future for all of we're just dealing with issues on our own front step? And, you know, how global is our understanding and what can we learn from others? Now, I'm going to make a case for wood, OK, as I've already said. I think wood's a tremendous material. It, it has incredible properties. It has a hierarchical structure, as this, this uh, cartoon demonstrates. We can go all the way from the molecular scale, all the way up into the, the macro scale, and the mechanical properties of this material are quite phenomenal. In fact, so great are the properties of, of timber that we can now actually uh, envisage building skyscrapers from from timber using a thing called cross laminated wood. But we can also make things called like super wood. I've got some super wood here actually on my desk. It's um, it's pretty strong stuff actually. Uh, this is a, a data point here showing the modulus of elasticity of super wood compared to uh, other wood, wood materials and polymers down here. And this has been uh, compressed and stretched with some of the lignin removed, and it feels pretty much like a carbon fiber composite. So could we actually um, make some more materials like this? Could we actually take wood and make it behave more like a, 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 um, other materials, like maybe even metals, for instance? And this was the um, topic of the science paper, that by actually um, uh, taking natural wood, actually it only really works with hardwoods, but I think I've got a way of making it work with softwoods. You take uh, uh, the, the wood, which has uh, these vessel elements in here, and you partially delignify, and you get this sort of shrunken, uh, crumpled uh, state in the, in the vessel elements. And then if you water shock, if you, if you suddenly re-swell at a rapid rate, you, get, you still retain um, uh, some of this crumpled structure to the, to the vessel elements. And that gives it its extensibility. So you add basically a strain component into the, into the wood and you're able to bend the wood and mold it into this honeycomb structure here. And actually the 3D molded wood outperforms again, other, other softwoods and hardwoods in this case and polymers. And in fact, performs just as well, if not better than aluminium. So you can make some really quite uh, strong and stiff materials um, uh, and from, a, from, a, from something that has actually sequestered carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in its production. That's the middle there. So I've got an EPSRC fellowship at the moment and it's a five year program. It gives me 50% of my time to vote to research. And um, 
the primary aim of the, the, the technical side of it is to try and take in inspiration from how cellulose assembles in the cell walls and plants and try and replicate that in synthetic systems. And we're looking at a thing called amphifelicity, that is where um, um, a material has a charged group and a, and a hydrophobic group, so we can get things to disperse in water. And we're looking at broadly more water interactions of cellulose in general. There's an EDNI element to this, and um, just looking at some data, in 2017, it showed that 11% uh, of the engineering workforce was female, and that's roughly the same today. Um, we have, rough, have the lowest percentage of female engineering professionals in Europe, less than 10%, and just 15% of engineering graduates in the UK, undergraduates in the UK were, were women in 2017. But in 2017, there were just 30 black female professors, according to the HESA statistics. And we're more likely to employ black staff as cleaners, reception support, and in le lecturers or professors. And more than 70% of people teaching in British universities look like me, they're white men, okay? Um, and those figures have pretty much not changed since then. Um, and so stories like this, fewer than 1% of UK university professors are black. And this uh, five-year programme aims to try and address this through training, outreach, cultural change, and also recruitment. And looking at how we can, how we can sort of push the needle a bit more and, and, and try and, and do better in terms of these statistics. Because actually, sustainable composites as a, as a discipline is very diverse. It's a worldwide... Um, activity and there's there's a huge contribution uh, being played by non-white members of, 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 of the academe, but it's just not being recognised in UK academic uh, circles. So it's centering black scholarship within that as well. So um, I'm very lucky to have two great uh, postdocs who started on the uh, the fellowship, Dr. Amaka Onyanta and Anita Atal, and. Uh, Amaco is going to be looking at making some of these amphiphilic nanocellular suspensions and trying to combine them with thermoplastics into a, 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 a processing a, a route to make composite materials. This sort of goes against the grain of what, what typically happens as we try and, um, and, and add functionality to the surface of cellulose to make it more compatible with thermoplastics, but we're kind of doing the opposite. We're kind of keeping that uh, interaction with water as well and trying to make it do both really. And um, Anita Rital is looking at um, uh, interaction of water with cellulose, but in a different way, looking at water purification and trying to modify the surface of cellulose using some natural products to, to capture uranium um, uh, ions uh, from um, uranium contaminated water. And um, she's been working out in South Africa, doing a lot of this work. Um, with communities that live next to uh, contaminated water and have to use that water on a daily basis. But they're also involved in this activity of EDNI and STEM. STEM, sorry, am I running over time? Um, yes, you are a little bit, Steve. And sorry. I'm finished. Actually. So there we go. Any questions? <clears throat> we can take questions in the panels um, after lunch. <laughs>